Okay, Sanjeev, we were talking about you today with your Tesla. The guy who got comfortable in driving the all-electric Tesla in five minutes. Yeah, he said, hey, no problem. That was a surprise for all of us. We all sat here with five minutes, really. Oh, yeah. I've heard I know you love it. Yeah. Done right. Well, great. Yeah, that's great. Our clock is only 200 miles. There's a lot farther than that. So uh, I would like to uh, go ahead and you ready to go there? I'm ready. Okay, so go ahead and roll the camera. Oh, we're gone. You going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I want to uh, uh, congratulate uh, Ken Coons on being here from Las Vegas. My tax man. Thank you. Hey, it's perfect coming here. I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's about, I mean, think about taxes. How many people want to reduce their taxes? Yeah. How many of you want to do it legally? Yeah. I'm not the guy for you then. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So you uh, say. <laughs> I, mean, see, I mean, you think about it. Coming here, I spent two nights here. I stayed at the Spanish Garden Inn with my wife, Tracy. And we walked around town, went out to dinner. And we had a great time. And the best part about it, people ask, like my father, he said, why are you going down there? You should be sticking home. It's shrimping season. You go out shrimping with me uh, today. And I said, because I can write it off. That's why I'm coming down here. So when I come down here, everything I did for the last two days basically was a 30% deduction for me. And so that's the way I look at uh, running my business, and that's the way you should approach running your business as well. But today we're, we're going to touch on taxes just a little bit as it relates to real estate investors. And I'm going to give you a lot some strategies on how to hide your real estate, how to protect your real estate. We're going to cover a, a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I'm going to just scratch the surface on what you should be doing uh, when it comes to asset protection. But a little bit about myself. Why, why am I here? Why would you want to bring in Clint to talk about asset protection for real estate investors? Well, you know, I started out in real estate when I was probably six years old. And the reason I say that is my parents, or my father especially, he wanted indentured servants. So my brother and I were indentured servants to my father. And my father worked hard at building up a real estate portfolio. In fact, he continued with that work until my brother, who was younger than me, graduated from college. Any ideas why he quit at that point in time? No more free labor. That's exactly right. Once he lost his free labor, he quit buying new properties. So uh, I grew up in this, and you know, that kind of guided where I wanted to go. In fact, you know, being an attorney was not something that was on my radar screen. In fact, I wanted to be a contractor. And when I was in undergrad, I was a framer. So during the summertime, I would frame. And I thought that I was going to go on and become a contractor, but in 92, there was a construction slowdown in Washington. And you know what does it do in uh, Seattle? And you say, you know, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, rain. June. Rain. Exactly, it rains, right? So here I'm up on a roof, uh, three stories because of the back, because I had a daylight in, in there, and I'm fixing some bird blocks, and repairing some things that somebody else had screwed up on. It's pouring down rain. And when I was up there, they didn't have tie-offs back then. All right, you just got up there, you had to be agile like a cat and hope that you don't slip off. And I started slipping. And I caught myself with my hammer and I just said, you know what, this is crazy. All right, I don't like working in the rain, uh, number one. And that's hard to do outside when you're a contractor. So I decided to go to law school. And, and what fostered some of that was my grandfather. My grandfather he was an attorney for 50 years in Bremerton, a small area in which I grew up. And you know, what's interesting is that uh, I saw the how, how an attorney relates to real estate investors, that is my grandfather being a general practice attorney, is that he didn't understand what my, my dad, what Craig was doing with his real estate investing. And he never once sat down with his son and looked at him and said, you really need some asset protection. Okay? You, you should protect yourselves, if not from your tenants. I mean, you have two, two boys. and you know, they're somewhat uh, crazy the way they, they, they get along. And um, so you should at least protect yourself from your kids. And never occurred. I got a zero asset protection. You know how you handle cases? Hey, what was a judge talking about? Settling, right? That's what he would do. My father got sued, he would just settle to make it go away. My grandfather would tell him, oh, just pay him off, make it go away. And then I saw my father when it came to taxes. When I went to, when I was in college, I was fortunate enough that my father felt that uh, he at least owed, owed us something, my brother and I, for all the work that we did. Uh, and he helped pay for our college education, he paid for it. So I was very fortunate to have that. But he didn't do it the right way. The way my dad did it is he earned all the money himself and then 
pay taxes on it, the highest possible tax rate, and then pay, use whatever was left over to send us to college. So essentially, in order for me to go to college, my father was in partnership with the Internal Revenue Service. That's how I went to college, because he paid that so much money. And we could have done it but smarter, but he didn't have the professionals that understood his business, understood my father, that gave him the right advice to do that. So my dad settled lawsuits rather than just not get involved in them because he wasn't because he could set them up in a way in which he wasn't worth suing, and he overpaid in taxes. And this formulated a lot of who I am today and how I approach the practice of law. So when I graduated law school, I started a firm. It's called Anderson. Uh, and people often ask, well, who's the Anderson at the firm? And that's a longer story. If you come to one of my other events, I'll go into that. But it's quite interesting. Um, but to suffice to say, when I started the firm with another partner named Toby Mathis, when we started the firm, our primary focus was working with real estate investors, stock traders, because we started the firm, it was 99, the stock market was going crazy at that point in time. And so we really focused on showing small business owners, stock traders, real estate investors, how to reduce their taxes, how to protect their assets. And that propelled the growth of our firm. So when we started out, it was all about asset protection. And then over time, what we did is we morphed into taxation. And so then we created a tax department inside of our firm. And the reason was is that the people that work with us, they had a hard time finding a professional understood what it is that we do. Okay? Their professionals were not up on it, so they're often down on it. And when they're down on it, it then creates doubt in our clients' minds as to the structures that we've created for them. Because they can't find the advice locally that matched up with what we were telling them. Because our offices are in Seattle and they're in Las Vegas. And so we're not down in California, we're not in Santa Barbara. And so to go out and find someone who understands what it is you're doing can be very difficult and daunting. And so we decided to create a, a tax department inside of our firm. It grew very slowly. And so now we also have financial planning as well inside of the firm. And between the two offices, we have about I don't know, 80 some people between the two offices. Uh, so there's, it, it's quite an extensive operation now. And, and we work solely in this area. We do not engage in litigation. Well, I'll take that back. I engage in litigation for my mother-in-law. Okay, they say the stat general statistic is you're going to be involved in five lawsuits during your lifetime. My mother-in-law waited until I married Tracy, my, my wife, uh, 24 years ago. Well, actually, we got married before I went to law school. But um, you know, once I once I graduated law school and passed the bar, it's, it's, it seemed like my mother-in-law said, "Hey, now that I have Clint, uh, he has to do everything for free. I might as well create some issues with my neighbors." So I got to deal with all that. It's still ongoing, you know. <laughs> 17 years, she still has not learned. And I heard the judge talking about juries, and you know, sitting on juries. My mother-in-law, you know, give an idea who she is. She loves jury duty, okay? And this is why you don't you want to avoid the legal system altogether, because she'll take the whole month of November, that's typically when she gets called, and she will not, I mean, she'll answer her phone, she'll go, who is this? Oh, uh, Mom, this is Tracy, your daughter. Don't call me, I'm waiting for a call from jury duty. And she'll hang up on my daughter, her daughter, my wife. Yeah, because it turns a reality television show. She wants to be on it so bad. She's the last person you want sitting in judgment of. Okay? But that's not unusual. All right? And so I've had, I have some litigation experience. I try to stay out of court. I don't, we don't get involved with that unless it's family. So what I do want to share with you, though, is um, some of the issues facing real estate investors and the importance of proper planning. And the reason why we want to plan is because we want to eliminate or limit risk to the greatest extent as possible. That's what we're trying to do. And risk comes at us in, di in different areas, and it's understanding how that risk relates to our business. And what I want to share with you is an individual um, that came into our office, came in to meet with me back in, I think it was October of last year, November of last year. And he's a real estate flipper in Seattle. He'd been flipping for two years, and he saw me on YouTube, he said, oh, this guy's in my backyard. I've never heard of him before. And the reason why is because we don't go to court. So I don't know many attorneys. Everything for us is through word of mouth or through our educational events that people come to know Anderson. So I don't have a, a lot of dealings in my local legal community. And quite frankly, I can't stand most attorneys that I meet anyways. Uh, people always say, why don't you like him? I said, well, what's the difference between lawyer and liar? pronunciation All right. and, and I can say that because I've dealt with attorneys before you know and it's it's very frustrating because so many attorneys nowadays make the case they take their clients issue and they make it their own issue 
And so you can't even deal with them on a rational level because they're so wrapped up in their client's problems and they make it their own problem. And so that's really uh, formed a lot of my opinion of the practice of law and attorneys in general. But suffice to say, this guy wants to meet me. And I tell him I'll be happy to meet with him, but I wanted him to provide me some information. I wanted to see his last year's tax return. And I asked him to send me a asset, fill out an asset questionnaire and send that in as well with his tax return. And then we would meet in my office weekends. So he came in and we sat down and he said, Clint, I'm a real estate flipper. I said, yeah, I understand that. I said to him, well, what are you doing as far as structuring is concerned? He said, well, I want to talk to a local attorney up in Bill. And that attorney told me I need a limited liability company. I said, he did? He goes, yep, told me I need it for asset protection. Now, that attorney gave him accurate information. An LLC will provide you accurate information. Here's a guy who's been flipping properties for two years. He's been a sole proprietor. He's run up a ton of liability because the statute of limitations in Washington is six years like it is in California under any contract that you sign. So he could be sued for up to six years later for something he did he's already forgotten about. And so he's built up this liability for two years. By putting the LLC in place, that makes sense. You're going to limit your liability exposure with a limited liability company. I said, you got accurate information. I said, well, what about your tax side on that? He said, well, then my attorney told me to go talk to a CPA, which isn't unusual because attorneys do not like to talk about taxes because most of them don't understand it. So they punt to the CPA. They went and talked to a CPA, and the CPA told them, you need to set it up as an S corporation because an LLC is a hybrid. You can choose to have a tax as a C corp, an S corp, disregarded, partnership. So he chose S corporation, which, based upon the CPA's advice, that if you set it up as an S corporation, he told them, you will minimize your employment tax because right now you're a Schedule C filer. So you're paying at the highest tax rate, plus you have to pay employment taxes on the first $115,000, which is an additional 15.4%. So by having a tax as an S corporation, you'll save $6,500 a year in taxes, roughly. Again, again, gave great information. I cannot dispute what the attorney told him, nor can I dispute what the CPA told him. What's the problem? The problem is that the information he presented, both of these professionals presented, that presume to know what he is that he's doing, is that the information I gave him is not relevant. See, neither one of those guys are real estate investors. I'm an avid real estate investor. I invest all over the country. I own property in seven different states. I've been a flipper. Okay, right now buying whole. I have commercial, residential. So I understand the real estate investor's dilemma when it comes to getting good information and putting together proper structures. This guy flips properties. I looked at him and I said, you have a problem that neither one of those two professionals spotted. And he goes, really, what's my problem? I said, the problem is you can't borrow money from traditional lenders. I said, you're using hard money. He goes, how do you know that? I said, well, on your tax return, I'm looking at your interest payments, number one. Also, on your tax return, um, I see your Schedule C filer. So everything's showing up on your personal Schedule C. And on your asset questionnaire you sent me, you have a personal residence with four, five, six hundred thousand dollars in equity, and I forget the exact amount. And I said, if I was you, and I had that type of equity in my house, I'd be down at a bank right now pulling a home equity line against my property, use that cash for my investing, but you've been using hard money, you're probably paying 12 to 14 percent based upon what you're writing off here on interest. And the reason is because when you went down to a bank, they look at your tax return, they threw up, and they told you they're not going to deal with you. Am I right? He goes, yeah, how did you know that? I said, because this is what I do. Okay? I work with real estate investors. I work with lenders. I know what they're looking for when they're evaluating somebody's tax return and the type of business you're in. And you're putting yourself in a situation where you're not going to improve your financial picture. Because by use, utilizing the structures the attorney and the CPA recommended, you're not going to change anything. You're still going to struggle with getting loans because an S corporation is a pass-through. It's going to show up on your tax return at the end of the year on your 1040. You're going to have a K-1 now. When you go in to apply for the loan, the banks are going to know you're in business for yourself because they're going to see that K-1 on your return and the first thing they're going to ask you is, what do you do for that corporation? What does that corporation do? And then you're going to have to tell them. And then they're going to see the profit and loss and the tax return for the corporation. Now, think about this. You have a business set up. Are you in business to pay the most you can in taxes or the least amount? <laughs> least, right? So you're writing everything off that you can. You're coming to Santa Barbara and you're writing it off while you're here. 
So when you write things off like this, what does it do to your profitability of your company from a tax perspective? Lowers it. Goes down. So if you go into a bank and you go to apply for a loan and you show them your business tax return, it shows that you make no money. Do you look like someone they want to loan to? No, not at all. And then maybe you say, well, really, I do make money, but it's the way I, prefer, I set up my tax return that it appears that I make nothing. And then they might look at you and say, so you cheat on your taxes. <laughs> okay, so, so you're going to be caught in this situation. And I asked him, I said, do you want to have access to 3.5%, 4% loans? He said, that's what I want. That's what I need to make my business grow. And I said, then unfortunately, the advice you received is not pertinent to you. It's not relevant. What you need is a C corporation. And that's when he did this, lean way back. Mm -hmm. And I immediately said, C Corporation, why would I want that? Have you ever heard anything negative about C Corporations mm -hmm. before? What's the worst thing about a C Corporation that everybody always says? Double, tax. Tax. Double taxation. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Lack of creativity on how to spend money, okay? <laughs> if you know how to write off money out of your, uh, out of your corporation, you're not going to have a double taxation problem. Double taxation for people who don't know how to expense everything out. There's plenty of ways to expense everything out. Double taxation only occurs when your corporation makes money, you pay tax on it at the corporate level, and then you decide to pay yourself out a dividend. And I would never encourage any of my clients to ever engage in that. So double taxation is not a problem. It's only a problem for the uninformed who do not understand how corp C corporations work. But the reason why it's a, such a strong tool for the flipper is because when you flip property through a C corporation, none of that shows up on your 1040. I mean, you got to think about what the banks want to see. What do the banks want to see? If you're going to borrow money, what they want to see is somebody has a very strong W-2. I make $175,000 a year. Oh, you do? You fit right in our little box. Great. Congratulations. Now we're going to give you $500,000 against your personal residence. That's how it works. If you walk in with a tax return that shows K-1s attached to it, here and there, and they see all the stuff going on, they look at you and they say, oh, I don't know if we could do that one. I'm telling you from personal experience because I've been there. Two years ago, there's this great deal going on with HUD owned properties. Uh, you can get, I think the interest rate was 1.5% fixed. And I put an offer in on three properties down in Colleen, Texas, which is right next to a, a military base down there. And I couldn't get the loan to close. And I kept fighting with Bank of America because they were running the program and they would not close this loan because they didn't understand my tax return. My tax returns are very complicated, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that I have a law firm uh, that's treated as an S-Corp. It has to be for pasture purposes, so that shows up on my 1040. And I'm in some partnerships with some commercial deals with other real estate investors that I'm partnering on, so all that shows up on my 1040. So when I submit my 1040, they always want to see copies of this LLC, that LLC, this S-Corporation, this business. And once I give them that, which initially when I go in to apply for a loan, I provide all that to the broker. I said, you're going to need all this. Oh, no, 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 we don't need that. I said, underwriting's going to ask for this. Take it now. And they'll take it, and then they'll forget. I think they just trash it and only send my <laughs> 1040 in. Because invariably, within three weeks, I get a request. Underwriting wants to see this, this, and this, and this. I said, yeah, I gave that to you. Well, yeah, well, I don't know what happened to it. I gave it over to underwriting. No, they, they threw it away. Because they don't understand themselves. A broker is what underwriting wants to see. I've been down this road so many times. So I keep a little folder on my computer, it's called my loan folder, that I periodically update. Every quarter I'm updating with profit and loss, balance sheet for all my business entities, and I give that over to the lender. And so when you give them too much information, you give them reasons to deny your loan. I've been in a situation before where a US bank has walked in, three guys in suits. I'm one week from closing on a commercial property and knew exactly what they were gonna do. They were gonna screw me on this deal, and they did. They said, well, We've looked at it, Clint. We're really fighting hard for you. We will not do this loan. We cannot do it for you. I said, you know how much money you're going to cost me by stringing me along through this entire process? Because I kept get, trying to get assurances from them. I said, hey, there's something's going on here. I mean, this should go. Oh, no, we're gonna, it's all going to be handled. It's all going to be handled. It's because they didn't understand my tax return. They didn't understand what they were looking at. And if, if you're a real estate investor, do not give up too much information. Too much information is what always gets people in trouble and gets the answer where if somebody doesn't understand it, the safest answer to say is no, is to pull back. But many of us, it's just a natural instinct we want to talk. I, when I was in law school, I worked for, uh, did a stint at the prosecutor's office for a while, and that didn't work out for me because they didn't want to put away the bad guys. And so then I went and I worked for another attorney where I was a public defender for Bonnie Lake. 
it's a misdemeanor docket, so I got to defend people who could not afford their own attorney. I did that for six months. I didn't lose a single case. Everybody I represented went to jail. And so, um, <laughs> I mean, they were guilty of what they were accused of. They are guilty of so many other things. They shouldn't be walking out on the street anyways. So I got fired. I, mean, I wasn't fired from the job. I was removed from that position. Was, you haven't won anything. I said, oh, we're doing a good thing here. Uh, so, but what I learned from that is when I talked to these people that I was defending, I said, why the hell do you say that? He goes, well, I thought I could talk my way out of it. I said, you're giving me too much information. You should have never said that to the arresting officer. Do you understand now that there's nothing for us to argue? Not that I would have anyways, but the point is, is that this is what people do. And when you're trying to borrow money um, and, and run a business, the less is always more. Okay, answer the question. The judge really didn't get into this, but that would have been, I bet, it would have been a really good topic for him to talk about negotiations. You know, when you're talking to people, you know, listen to their question and only answer their question. Don't volunteer information. Yeah, that was when I was dealing with my mother-in-law. I mean, that scared me to death dealing with her, bring her up through an arbitration. You know, I said, Nancy, you, you can all listen to what they say and don't answer anymore because she likes to talk too. And I said, you're not going to help our position here. So, limiting risk requires understanding that you can get accurate information, but it has to be relevant information to what it is that you're doing when it comes to investing. So, you got to know where you're most vulnerable. Um, contracts. Contracts are a huge problem. People don't understand the vulnerability there. I'll give you an example of a recent client that did this, signs a contract to buy six homes. Now, she has a first position lender, then she went out and got some gap funding. Anybody not familiar with gap funding? Mm -hmm. So she's got a gap funder set up for $70,000, $80,000. 10 days away from closing, she calls up her gap funder, said, hey, you gonna come to the table? He said, you know what, I'm sorry, but my money has not come back in yet from my last deal. I'm not gonna be able to meet this closing deadline, so I don't have the money for you. She calls up the seller and tell, explains to him, we can't close in 10 days. I need more time to get some more money together. The seller told her, if you don't close, I'm going to sue you. Now, here's her purchase sale agreement. She did it in her own name, and now she was staring down the lawsuit by the seller because what she didn't realize is that the seller had these six properties. They were short sales. And if he didn't close on this day, the, day the bank was going to pull back their short sale offer and then come after him on foreclosure and hit him for everything. Now that was a very expensive experience for her. She was able to work her way out of it, but it cost her an extra $45,000 to get out of that deal. That's not what you want to be in. Had that situation been structured a little differently, had she not entered into that contract in her own name, she could have walked, lost her earnest money, okay, because your money's gone hard by that point, but then she would have no personal liability. But she signed that contract, so she wasn't our client at the time, she would give our client after the fact, so that would never ever happen again to her. She should have limited her liability by having an entity on that she could have then entered into the agreement uh, with the seller on. Um, personal injury, okay, that kind of goes without saying, um, you know, to get out there on the freeway right now, uh, it's crazy, people drive, I mean, just driving up from LA, you know, there's people cutting in left and right of me. I mean, just think somebody stops short and you're driving a car and you rear in them, all right, and everything's in your own name, then you're, you're at risk. Um, one of my clients, I'm going to share another story with uh, in a little bit. He just the other day, well, it was a couple months back, he just finished up a case. Just settled it out, and he pulled out of a parking lot on the left and clipped somebody in an intersection. Yep, guy, kid jumped, you know, went over onto his hood, hit his windshield. He wasn't going very fast, but he clipped him in the intersection. He's going to be sued. Okay, there's just no doubt about it that this is going to result in a lawsuit. The question is, what are they going to collect? And you can find out that you've done some things to ensure that, that that's going to be minimized. So the personal injury is um, a problem. You also have problems with mold, toxic mold, when you own properties. Uh, you know, in California, there's an attorney that, that goes on the circuit, as I like to call it, where they teach CLEs, continuing legal education to other attorneys, that speaks specifically on toxic mold. What he trains attorneys to do is go out and sue landlords. I've been to his class. He came up to Washington State, taught us how to sue landlords for toxic mold. In fact, he gives us all the forms. He said, if you want to go sue a landlord, start with this shakedown letter right here. He basically said, I'll get them pissing in their pants when you send them this letter. And it works. And the reason I know it works, because our client received that same letter. We have a client down in Southern California that got that letter probably about four months after I had attended that CLE, because he's teaching the attorneys down here as well. And she called us up. She said, look at this letter that I received. And I started chuckling. She goes, I don't, well, why do you find this funny, Clint? I said, it's not about the fact you're being sued, it's just, this is just a scare tactic. 
It's an attorney that is trying to, that has given this letter out that people who attended the CLE, they received it, and, and this is the first step in trying to shake you down for money. Now, the problem is, with toxic mold, is that you don't have any experts. I mean, you do. Okay, they're called mold remediation experts, and those are expert witnesses at trial, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that most of them are charlatans, unfortunately. There was a show called The Lookout on ABC. I only watched one episode. I didn't think it's on anymore. But they were trying to expose people that are charlatans that are out there taking advantage of individuals. And the very first episode, the one I happened to catch, dealt with these mold remediation experts where they set up a house with cameras, with mics, hidden mics and cameras, brought in these mold remediation experts. Out comes a, a, a young gal. She said, you know, I'm concerned about my two-year-old and my three-year-old child, but there may be mold in this house. What do you think? And then they filmed them as he went throughout the house. Now the seven guys here right out, four of them didn't even test the house. They would sniff, one guy sniffed the wall. Okay, that was the extent <laughs> of his scientific uh, discovery there was to go out and sniff a wall. <coughs> the other guys would just talk on their cell phone, and then they would come out and tell the scout, yep, you got a serious mold problem. Three of them said you had no problem, but four of them said you had a problem. And then they brought him back in. Remember, you know, those shows to catch a predator. Mm -hmm. So they had that whole thing. The guys come out with the cameras and, and the mics. And they say, well, we have you on film here. Supposedly, you were determining whether or not there was toxic mold in here. You didn't do anything. So how did you reach your conclusion? And then they took off. Those are the expert witnesses that an attorney would call a trial to assert that there is toxic mold in your house. And in fact, in her house, they brought in two microbiologists from different universities that went through the property and said there isn't a single mold spore that they can detect with the equipment so the problem is you still have to face this issue. And in California, you know, the damages can be huge if it's found that there's toxic mold, if the jury agrees that there's toxic mold in your property. So many times you just end up settling. Your insurance is not going to cover you in this type of lawsuit because it's environmental. You're never covered under environmental. So in this type of case, you're on your own. Uh, bad tenants, okay, they're always a problem. Uh, there's, a, there's a case out of California that uh, really rings home for me. Uh, I remember one summer, like, my father was cited by the fire marshal in his buildings for not having working smoke detectors. So he, he got fed up with it, paying these fines, totally had to get this done. So my brother and I had to put cages over all of the smoke detectors through, throughout the buildings. And we put these cages over all the smoke detectors. Did that stop the problem of the tenant disabling the smoke detector so they could smoke cigarettes in the apartment? No. Nope. Nope. Whenever the tenant would move out, you'd walk in, you knew right where to go. You go to the first closet you can find when you walk into the apartment, what do you find in the back of the closet? All the smoke detectors laying on the floor in various states of torn apart with the cages and the batteries you're moving. Because a lot of times they want the batteries as well. Well, there's this guy, there's this building owner in California, this is probably about know, maybe eight or nine years ago now, and he kept warning this tenant got to quit smoking and disabling the smoke detector. You cannot do that. You're putting yourself at risk. Tenant did not listen. He would disable the smoke detector so he could smoke. And he'd been warned three times. Written warnings. Of course, the place catches on fire. Tenant's severely injured. They turn around, they sue the landlord. And the attorney gets $4.5 million. So that's how much he wins against the landlord. Um, now, why is that? Why is it that the landlord is held to be liable in a situation like this? What did he do wrong? Nothing. Nothing? Yeah, but what do you think the court law says? What should he have done differently? Which is possible. Should have evicted the tenant. They yeah, said he should have evicted the tenant. You ever try to evict a tenant in California? <laughs> it's fast, right? No, you go in, you can have Matt Ford burn himself. Yeah. Yeah. And if you mess up, you have to start over. You know, the judge was talking about demurs. This is how screwed up your legal system is down here. All right, I'll tell you. I've, I've litigated down here before. Um, plaintiff can come in. And they'll come in with a complaint, and they'll allege a certain set of facts. And then you, as the defense, follow the murder. You say, there's, based on the set of facts, there isn't a single legal issue here under which relief can be granted, Your Honor. That means this is all BS. Judge says, you're right. Plaintiff, go write another one. So they come in with another one. And guess what happens? The facts change. So, so originally it happened in Santa Barbara on Sunday at 12 noon. Now the, the, uh, the supposed harm happens in L.A. on a Thursday at 7 a.m. in the morning. And you're looking at this, you're saying, can you not see what's going on here, Your Honor? This is B.S. I mean, what did they say then? That's an issue for the jury. That's an issue for the jury to determine. 
<laughs> I'm not going to rule on that. <laughs> yeah. And that's when you look at the legal system, you say, it's all screwed up because then you have to pay for that. When you hire an attorney, you've got to go to court, you have to pay for it. I heard him talking about how long it takes. You know, what he didn't tell you, when you prepare, you got to pay your attorney to prepare. That assumes you even get the first trial date because what they do is they set first and second chair. First chair meaning that this guy, he, if he goes and you don't go to trial that day, you get, you get first chair six months later, three months later. But your attorney has to prepare as if he's going to go. So if the first chair settles, then they say, all right, you're ready to go. So